Thank you everyone for being here tonight to talk about the CBA for Union Square. The CBA is a community benefits agreement, which is a huge victory that we recently got after a whole lot of work for many, 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 many years. <laughs> um, a lot of people were involved, a lot of people who um, got involved for the first time in this kind of action of public power to get things that the community needs. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to see a video about what a community benefits agreement actually is. You love your neighborhood, but things are changing. Some changes are good for everyone, but others aren't. The rents are rising so quickly, many people can no longer afford to live or work in the town that they love. Your neighborhood is facing redevelopment, and as a result, the current population risks displacement. So who is responsible, and how can you ensure that development benefits the residents instead of replacing them? Let's start with the basics. Redevelopment is when a private development company buys property and turns it into something they can make a profit from. Redevelopment operations can vary in size, from a single lot to an entire neighborhood development plan. Ah, good thought. Why not voice your concerns with the city? They might even offer you meetings with the developer or a city-appointed planning authority who will listen to your concerns. The city will look out for you, right? Developers need city approval to build their projects. And here's where you'd want them to leverage a deal to benefit the residents. But developers have lots to offer a city. With campaign donations, project funding, and the fact that new development can bring increased tax revenue, new jobs, and amenities to attract new residents, it's not hard to see how a city might do everything it can to please the developers, often at the expense of the residents. Sometimes a small group is able to voice their needs, but what about everyone else? And how can you tell whether your concerns will be taken into account or dumped in the trash? When you get a new apartment, do you just trust that the landlord will respect your needs as a tenant? No, you need a lease or a legal agreement to guarantee that your needs are met and both sides do what they say they'll do. A contract between the concerned residents and the developer is called a Community Benefits Agreement. A CBA gives decision-making power to the community. A CBA is the only contract that can guarantee that the needs of the residents represented in community groups are included in plans for development. Because in a CBA, the community groups are signing and enforcing the agreement. Developers might not want to sign the CBA because it can restrict their profits or because they're already working out a deal with the city. But development should benefit you, the people who live and work here now and you deserve to have the power and influence over development. Your power grows with increased participation, with larger, more organized, and more diligent coalitions, with more active members, and through protests, petitions, and participation in public elections, the residents can demand the proper attention and leverage needed to get a CBA. An unhappy public can be a huge threat to both the city and developers. In contrast, addressing the needs of the residents with a CBA will ensure developers benefit from a happy community in support of the development to their city. Here in Somerville, US2 is the developer contracted by the city for a neighborhood-wide redevelopment in Union Square. We are Union United a rapidly growing coalition of Somerville residents, businesses, churches, unions, and community organizations joined in the effort to create development without displacement through specific goals outlined in a legally binding CBA with US2 and the city. But time is running out and we need you to join us. Participate in our meetings, spread the word, and make sure Union Square in Somerville is added to the growing list of communities across the nation who've developed with a Community Benefits Agreement. All right. 
Um, and it's interesting to think about this because it feels like both a million years ago and not that long ago at all that IKEA was about to break ground right here where we're sitting this evening and that obviously never happened and it turned into something else entirely. Um, can you tell us a little bit, uh, Mary Jo, about how this effort to win community benefits from developers started way back when? Sure, I can take a stab at that um, and others can add as, as you think of things. I'm Mary Jo Conley, uh, I'm a member of Union United and I've lived in Somerville over 20 years and um, this weekend I was doing the Wayback Machine, remembering how we first started organizing to get benefits for our community in Somerville. And um, I'm going to have a little PowerPoint that I can show while I'm talking to give you a little bit of flavor of that. Um, so the road to a Union Square CBA actually started, as you said, right here where we're sitting in Assembly Square. It used to be called Assembly Square. Um, when uh, a group of community residents in East Somerville called East Somerville Neighbors for Change, it was a small group, it had about, I'd say, 60 to 70 people on its mailing list and maybe 30 people at meetings. Um, ESNIC was the, the short name was a group that had done won some smaller things for the community. For example, had worked to get longer stoplights at the big intersection of McGrath and Broadway. That was one example. Or some resources for kids in the getting a park. Um, but we decided that with a huge development coming right next door, we needed to try and make sure that not only the developer would make a lot of money from this, but the community would get some benefit from it too. We knew it was going to be um, probably a lot of luxury housing, but there were going to be jobs too, both construction jobs and jobs long term. So we organized and it was, a, it was not as long a process as Union United, and by 2008 we had won a small um, agreement with IKEA, which was the group that was coming in. Um, it was the IKEA was supposed to be right here, and they signed an agreement with ESNIC, East Somerville Neighbors for Change, and the city to provide us with $100,000, some computers, and some training that would help residents who were had some skill gaps, whether they were English or experience or computer skills, would help them get ready for those jobs in advance of the jobs coming in. And then IKEA didn't come. They sold the land to Federal Realty, and Federal Realty marched on and ignored the agreement with IKEA, did not feel that it was, in, that it was bound by it. So we went on to the next step, um, and a group was started called Jobs for Somerville, which brought in people from ESNIC and other parts of the city who were really concerned about jobs being a critical element of what helps people not be displaced from their community. So we had a local hiring ordinance campaign that would have created an ordinance requiring every new big developer and big employer to hire first local residents and residents with barriers to employment, people with English needs, with other training needs, uh, women, immigrants, other people of color. Um, it was a hard fight. We didn't win that one. We also tried to get local residents hired on the Orange Line construction, at the stop that is functioning right here now. We didn't win that, but we won some friends over at the MBTA and the Department of Transportation. And a few years later, we got a signed agreement that they would prioritize local hiring on the construction of the Green Line, which was a really big deal. Finally, um, so we, what we were doing at that point was trying to lay the groundwork for a commitment for Somerville as a city um, to be the kind of place that cared about jobs. We also um, started a first source hiring program, which is very is alive and, and, and thriving at this point, which is a necessary part of what you need to, to help people who need jobs get connected with jobs, or people who need skills and training get connected with us. Um, let's see, where are we headed now? I'm sorry. Um, 
There was also work done on affordable housing during this period. There was a lot of legwork done to make sure that we had inclusionary zoning, and Somerville at 20% has the highest, one of the highest inclusionary in the country. So when we went in as Union United to fight for more affordable housing, we were fighting from a much higher standard than we had been. We also worked on zoning. So there was a, a committee started to look at land use that was trying to fight for things the community needed, like a grocery store in Winter Hill where the old Star Market is still sitting unused. Um, the community corridor planning process looked at how the Green Line Extension project could be a force for supporting residents, especially working class folks, um, and not displacing us. And all of those led us directly to Union Square. The Land Use Committee learned that the the city was trying to redevelop Union Square and we started following that process very early on and getting organized to try and bring the voice of community members to that process. We hadn't been strong enough for Assembly Square, but we knew we had to be much stronger and better organized to be able to get, win, to get at the table to be heard and to be part of the decision-making process, not just community meetings and charrettes with flip charts where we express our opinion, but nothing makes a difference. And that's where Union United came in. This is a little plan of, of Union Square redevelopment, and the big question for us was redevelopment for whom? Would the people who lived in, in Union Square and the businesses who worked there, many of them, long-time businesses like Ricky's Flowers or smaller immigrant businesses, would they get to stay to enjoy the fruits of the Green Line? Um, we had a whole lot of community processes and finally established Union United. Union United is a state coalition of stakeholders, like you saw in the little video, includes small business owners, residents, activists, immigrant groups, congregations, labor unions, community organizations. It was started by three groups, the Welcome Project, Somerville Community Corporation, and the, com the Community Action Agency of Somerville, but it grew to include over 40 groups and hundreds of residents. Here's some pictures of who is Union United. I am Union United. People felt very deeply invested and personally committed to it. And one of the sad things now is looking at how many of these people have had to move out of Somerville in the meantime. Um, we met often at the Concord Avenue Community Space, which was also a member, a community garden. And this brings us to how we were getting organized um, to win the Community Benefits Agreement. I just went over what Union United was, but again, our main goal was to get to the table and have decision-making power for working people and communities in Somerville because we knew if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. Thank you so much, Pedro. So you talked a little bit about Union United and um, what I would like to talk about now is what was different? What was different about this group? What was different about the CBA campaign? How was this? different from previous efforts to influence development in Somerville. Um, Lori, can you speak to that? Sure. I'll, um, I'm Lori Goldman. I am, I am Union United. <laughs> um, I'm also a member of Jobs for Somerville. I'm a, a member of the Somerville Community Corporation. And um, when I have time, I teach urban and environmental policy and planning <laughs> at Tufts University. So I want to say a little bit about that organizing work and the struggle that we have to get where we are now, picking up where Mary Jo left off. So we established Union United, and we had a clear goal goal. Um, we were really clear that people were um, under threat of being displaced. My own rent was escalating. Our neighbors were having to move away. We saw um, stores exiting. And we knew that we needed to harness the development that was happening and redirect those future profits into what was good for the people. So we knew that we needed um, something new to make that happen. And we had a strategy, which was the Community Benefits Agreement, that agreement between the people of Somerville, the community, 
and the developer directly, as you saw in that video. Um, and we had people. We had all of those people and those organizations behind our strategy because they were motivated to claim what is really rightfully ours as the community of Somerville. And we met um, every month and a lot more than every month. And we refined our goals. And we were very clear that we needed to have more affordable housing. And we needed jobs and the ways to help people get into those jobs. And we needed small business supports. And we needed green and open space. And we needed um, civic space. And we needed transparency in the process. And we needed a democratic participatory process that ensured that we would be there. And we were increasingly expert in understanding what we needed and how we were going to get there with our strategy. But at the same time, we were also being left, often left out of the city's efforts to get input from community for, to accompany this development process, the transit-oriented development in Union Square around the extension of the Green Line. We were left out of the civic, um, um, uh, the CAC, Advisory committee. advisory committee, and we were left out of the Locust Strategy Committee, or only a few of us got to participate in that. But we were not left out of all of those city processes for guiding the development that were, was happening because we showed up for the opportunities that people have to influence what is happening with the neighborhood planning process. And we showed up and we um, came with our clearly articulated vision for, na for, for um, the neighborhood of Union Square. And we came with our clearly articulated strategy that we don't need to only rely on city zoning and we don't need to only rely on a public benefits agreement between the city, the municipality, and the developer. We also need a community benefits agreement. And we came to many, many um, meetings and many hearings to make that that statement clear and we met with the developer and we met with people in the city and we met with one another and reinforced our goal and our strategy and our united front in moving that agenda forward. Um, but we were still getting pushback largely from the city, not only from the developer, who was saying, you don't need to have a community benefits agreement. We've got zoning, and we've got a public benefits agreement that the city will negotiate with the developer. And that's all good, and we were saying we are in favor of development, but we want development without displacement, and our strategy says, learning from others around the country, that we need a community benefits agreement in addition to that. And so we um, um, pulled together um, our many, many people and got signatures to have a citizen's petition. And we called our own hearing at City Hall. And hundreds of people came to that meeting. It was November 10th, 2016. Some of you will remember what happened just a few days before that, the national election. And people were on fire about showing that we can make a difference and we brought in national experts, and we brought in all of our expertise, and they had given us 30 minutes to have this meeting to explain why we needed a community benefits agreement. And we were still there two hours and 45 minutes later, late into the night, explaining why we needed a community benefits agreement. And the Board of Aldermen, what is now the City Council, voted and said, or, or, or endorsed that idea and agreed, we need a community benefits agreement in addition to that. Um, so that was one victory along the way. Um, and after that, um, the, um, the mayor and the administration heard this idea of, okay, a city benefits, a, a community benefits agreement can be part of the package. And they negotiated with US2, the master developer, a three-part package uh, called the Covenant that included a chunk of money for infrastructure and a chunk of money to pay for the cost overruns for the Green Line extension 
and $3.9 million for a community benefits agreement, which was wonderful. We got a commitment to a community benefits agreement, and we also got a commitment to saying that that would be negotiated with a body that represented the community. Um, this was the beginning of the idea of a neighborhood council that would be elected by the community. Um, so that was a big win, and it was a win with some limitations. We got the legitimation, the legitimacy of community benefits agreement with money, with recognition that the community would um, get to negotiate that directly with the developer, but we were also losing some leverage because it contained the amount of the benefits we could get to that dollar sign of $3.9 million. Not nothing, but also constrained. Um, and so our work continued um, together with the Neighborhood Council and Union United continuing our work. And alongside this effort to build the Neighborhood Council and then to launch into the negotiation of the Community Benefits Agreement with the master developer, we were still organizing to make sure that the proceeds of development and the process of development would actually benefit us, the people of Somerville, with all of those issues that we cared about. And so again, we did citizen petitions, and we went to City Hall, and we won three really key elements that are now codified in ordinances and in zoning in the city of Somerville. As Mary Jo um, pointed to earlier, we increased the inclusionary zoning so that it moved from 12.5% of new um, housing development over a certain size goes to affordable housing. Today, it's 20% of new um, development over 30,000 square feet will go for affordable housing. And that's because we organized to get there. That became a stepping stone, a first stop, a, fir a starting point for the negotiation of the Community Benefits Agreement. And we increased the housing linkage fee so that developers who are developing large properties are, are putting, um, oh, this is, I made a little error, which we can correct in the subtitles to this, uh, that the, 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 how, the um, inclusionary zoning um, um, does not depend on those uh, square footages. It's the linkage fee. Um, so instead of only paying $5.15 per square foot for, into the housing trust fund for affordable housing. It's now $10 per square foot into the housing trust fund. And the third win um, was that we created the first ever jobs trust fund. So now $2.46 of square feet of commercial development is going into a pot of money that will be used for job training and job creation and job retention. And that um, didn't exist before, all three of those are underlying the wins that we got in the, the community benefits agreement that Van was part of negotiating. Thank you so much, Laurie. And, and those victories were such important building blocks to get us to where we are now. I think if, if we hadn't gotten those three things, we would be much further back. Even if there had been a CBA, it would be nothing like the CBA that we have today had it not been for all of the work that went into organizing for those um, for, for linkage fee and for the jobs fund and for inclusionary zoning, which is, it's still, it's still amazing to me that Somerville is one of the places in the country with the highest uh, percentage of inclusionary zoning. Um, it's really amazing and the result of this hard work. So we're talking about the CBA and um, what's, what's in it? What's actually in the CBA? What are some of the victories band that we were able to achieve with this negotiation that got into this document? Well, the, the focus that we had, or particularly I had with um, uh, coming out of the Union United and being on the negotiating team was that uh, we wanted the development to not result in displacement of, of residents or small businesses. So one of the things that, that came up, you know, mentioning like inclusionary as a kind of a, um, a foundation that we could work from there was, uh, it was 20%, but that's over the three phases of development that were gonna occur. So um, most of the, the housing, the affordable housing that was planned 
um, by the developer was planned in the third phase, long after people have already been displaced. So one of the, the successes that we had was that we wanted to move the affordable housing to the front of to the first phase of the, the project. And so we succeeded in doing that. We got uh, the total number of uh, housing that they had planned on over three phases, which would be over 20 to 30 years, was um, about a thousand units. And of those at 20%, 200 would have been affordable. Um, we knew that you know the ones that would come in the third phase would not impact displacement at all. So what we did was we moved it up to the front of the, in the first phase, and we were able to get 150 units in the first phase. 28% um, we, you know, we got in the first phase, uh, 39 units of affordable housing that um, um, are not required by the inclusionary. This is in addition to the inclusionary. And uh, we were able to double the, the percentage of family size, two to three bedrooms, in the first phase of affordable housing. That's one of the issues. Um, family housing is a problem. Um, most of the developers want uh, small units. They can, you know, they get more money uh, by, you know, single bedrooms, uh, studios, and two to three bedrooms are, you know, three bedrooms the developer won't build. Uh, it's just not feasible for them, according to them. Um, so what we did was we pushed to get more two and three bedrooms in the first phase. Um, we also were able to um, get um, in workforce, the, the two pillars of displacement are housing, affordable housing and workforce development. And so we were able to get um, safer working conditions for the construction of the entire three phase development. That was one of the, the challenges we, uh, the developer wanted to try to con continue to only negotiate which in the first phase, and we were able to get that uh, across all three phases. Um, we were able to, um, um, the uh, well, one of the things that we were able to get was the uh, neutrality. There's, they're planning on building a hotel, and um, we wanted to get a PLA. We weren't able to get that. We did get, we were able to move them in terms of um, uh, union hire but we did get neutrality on the hotel. So that means that, um, that the, the, the owner, um, the tenant, the hotel owner will not oppose a union. If, they, if the workers want a union, they just have to sign cards and it doesn't go to an NLRB election. Um, and um, see the, oh, the other thing is, is that the developers full-time employees will be paid at at least $2.25 per hour, more than the state minimum wage. The minimum wage is going up pretty dramatically, so there'll be a $2.25 attachment to that. And that also binds the facility management firm that's hired by the developer. Um, let's see, funding for the uh, Somerville Community Corporation, the first source program. Um, you've heard about the earlier first source program. And uh, what, what will happen there is that um, US2 will pay for a staff person, 100,000 a year uh, for a staff person to um, basically work with local residents uh, for making sure that they get the jobs that are coming with the development that's occurring. Um, and also uh, making sure that they have the training that they're gonna need because one of the things that we realize is that there's a, a skills gap where the jobs that are coming in don't necessarily match the skills of the people that live here. And so what we want to do is we want to close that gap. So that's, uh, so we put another uh, $1.5 million into the uh, jobs retention and um, uh, the uh, jobs retention task force uh, run by the city. And that'll be used for uh, developing what we, what we want is the, that money to be used so that um, any kind of barriers to employment, uh, childcare, transportation, things like that can be taken care of uh, so that people are able to get to the trainings that they need so that they can then get the jobs that they, that, you know, higher paid uh, living wage jobs and um, so that they don't get stuck in the low wage kind of um, poverty cycle that, that is common. Um, 
We also were able to get uh, funding for the jobs, um, the, uh, the main streets. Uh, what we did was we negotiated so that we could get a position with main streets that'll work with the small businesses so that it's very similar. It's linked into the first source program so that we're training people for the jobs that are coming up. Um, but the first, the, the main streets position also will be working with local um, uh, businesses so that if they have to transition from one place to another during the development, that they'll be taken care of, that, you know, there'll be rent subsidies, there'll be um, opportunities for them to uh, occupy space in the new uh, development that's coming up. Um, Let's see, the, um, the other things that, th that's the kind of housing and jobs picture. And then um, the, um, for arts, we were able to get $25,000 per year for 10 years to underwrite public art installations and performances in Union Square. Uh, we were, uh, one of the things that I should add is that with um, the um, affordable housing, we were also to get that to be a passive house. So what will happen is, is that people will be, in an apartment that they can afford, plus their their utilities will go down. So it's much more affordable than if it was just a regular place. Um, and we had to push for that. They did not want to do that. Um, so uh, we also were able to get certified lead gold and, and um, uh, certified silver for all buildings that will be built and they'll be solar ready. So uh, one of the things that's happening is just that uh, with climate change becoming much more of an issue, there's uh, increase in interest in the uh, investment you know, sector around um, uh, climate change, sustainability. And so having the solar roofs uh, will allow for the, the, those kind of businesses to come into Union Square and flourish. And plus they will be able to reduce the cost of the buildings that, you know, particularly the affordable buildings and the uh, lab spaces, the office buildings, all those, that'll be an attraction for um, tenants. Um, let's see, we also got 4, 40,000 square feet of uh, photovoltaic surface on the roofs. Um, and that's gonna also be built in the first phase. Um, commitment to a blue roof on the first commercial building. The first commercial building is going to be a life science building. And um, the blue roof is basically a way of capturing rainwater. Um, we got dedicated parking spaces for electric vehicles and charging stations at the entrance to the garage. Um, and the developer will also participate in the MBTA perk program. So uh, people will be able to get subsidized uh, transportation to and from work. And uh, we were able to get a second neighborhood sized park at Warren and Bow Street and a third neighborhood sized park at the corner of Allen and Charlestown streets. And we got a commitment to an indoor civic space for meetings located in the first phase until a large space can be developed where the police station is now. Yeah, so I mean, you know, obviously you've heard about all the hard work that's been done over the past few years, um, several years, and we've won all these uh, incredible things. But if we don't have a way to, you know, hold the developers accountable, then it's all going to mean squat. But the most important thing to remember is that this CBA is a legally binding document um, so that, you know, there is a there are processes in place for making sure that we're meeting everything that we need to and we're, we're getting everything we were promised by the developers. Um, so in Union Square, we have a Union Square Neighborhood Council and that council has a board, which Aunt Camaro is a part of. Um, and so we can talk a little bit more about the you know, Union Square Neighborhood Committee in a moment, but they will, uh, essentially they were heavily involved in you know, working with the uh, negotiating team to get the CBA and they will appoint uh, a board of seven people who will be the CBA implementation board. And those seven people will meet quarterly with the developers during construction to make sure that um, everything is being met. And before, ahead of these meetings, basically the committee will issue uh, questions to the developers 
And the developers will respond to those questions with a report saying whether or not they're meeting these things. And um, if either party finds, you know, if, if, if the board finds that US2, the developers are defaulting on any of their commitments, um, then they issue a written notice. And the idea is to try to resolve things internally and have meetings and figure out why they're not meeting, um, you know, their commitments. Uh, and if that doesn't work, uh, then we move into mediation. Um, and then there can be mediation between, uh, you know, the, the Union Square Neighborhood Council and um, the developers. And, you know, that's a little more official. Um, and then if all of those efforts really don't work um, because it is a legally binding document, you know, we can go to court. But obviously that is, you know. Last dramatic reserve, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that's the process and plan for holding the developers accountable. Yeah. So the community presentations with vote are September 22nd and 23rd, and there will also be a, fault, a voting period that's open past that. So, um, so we've talked about the CA, we've talked about what we need to do to make sure that the developer is held accountable for all of these wonderful things that are written into it. Um, if anybody has any questions, this would be a good time to write them down, give them to Lizzie. Lizzie, can you raise your hand? Yes, Lizzie. If you guys have any questions, write them down, give them to Lizzie, and we'll um, include them. Um, what's next for Union United, this is a great agreement, there's a lot in there, but are there things that we still want to try to fight for that didn't end up getting included for whatever reason? Yeah, there are some things that we're still working on. Um, part of the covenant is that we have a permanent um, community center. We have temporary in the CBA now. Um, the why MCA on Highland Ave is selling their building and they would like to come into Union Square and that would be a perfect permanent community center for Union Square because that would that would you know satisfy everything that we want they're open to bringing a library in and um, all kind of things for youth elderly and, and everybody else um, they want to purchase the land that the public safety building is on and it's a question of, is this a city, the city needs to negotiate that or the negotiating team and it goes back and forth. And I think that needs to be worked on. I think the three, the why the negotiating team and the city needs to get together and figure that out together. Um, One of the other, you know, I mean, as much as we would like to say that this is done and yeah. we can move on, <laughs> um, it's not. And there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at right now is is taking the experience that we just had with the CBA and looking at how can we expand it beyond like just negotiating with one developer at a time. Uh, what we want to do is is institutionalize some of the things. Uh, for example, like the the doing the affordable housing up front. That's necessary, and so we should in, you know incorporate that in zoning in any kind of documents that the city has so that it doesn't isn't left to the community to have to negotiate that. Um, there's a number of things like that, that that should have been negotiated by the city. And, and what we want to do is make sure that that happens in the future. That would cover any development that's occurring in the city um, if we can do that. And uh, we can do that through a community benefit ordinance. Um, but what that would do is then allow the neighborhoods to still organize and still you know, sit down and, and be at the table with the developer. Uh, the difference would be that they would be able to focus on more specific things that are unique to their particular community. We weren't able to do that. We had to deal with like broad issues, um, you know, and that's that's another thing that with the CBA that's uh, kind of uh, interesting is, is that um, you're negotiating with in typically like in a labor contract, you're negotiating with one community of interest in with a CBA. You're negotiating with several different communities of interest, and that makes it a lot more complicated because you have a variety of, of interests that you have to satisfy. And so I found that challenging. 
Um, I think that, that we were able to cover that and, and do the best that we could, but it's something that uh, could be dealt with much more efficiently in the future. I, I agree with the challenge of meeting so many really pressing demands. And there are more on the list of things that we didn't get. For example, we um, didn't get underground parking in every place. We didn't get more permeable surfaces. We wanted a lot more affordable housing. There are all of these other things that we didn't get, partly because we didn't have all of that leverage. And that's what Van was just emphasizing. But I think part of what I'm taking away is something really beautiful that happened at the same time it was really hard which is that so many different types of people and types of organizations yeah. were part of making this happen people who have been long time summer generations of people in Somerville and people like me have only been here for 12 years <laughs> um, and people who are new because they are new to this country um, and people who are new because they came here to go to grad school. Um, yeah. And um, people from all different interests are coming together. Labor, who is often in, com in conflict with people who are concerned about the cost of producing affordable housing. We've all, in this really often difficult challenge, have been working together, which means that there is room for everybody to be involved in the next efforts of making sure that it still happens, of doing the work that Van mentioned about um, creating the infrastructure that will continue to operate, and of replicating um, the, the approach in other neighborhoods at the same time we're working for citywide um, efforts of this sort. So if you are watching this and you are thinking that you want to remain in this wonderful city of ours, well then you have acknowledged that you are a really vital part of making this happen because that's the power behind it is that so many of us were part of doing this and will continue to be part of doing it. And um, uh, we need everyone. And, and that's always been one of the most striking things to me about this process is just walking into a room and seeing all of these different stakeholders um, who are there and who are really engaged and who really want to have their voices heard. Um, and, and the room that is created in the spaces where this process is taking place for people to feel comfortable doing that, um, even if they don't have a lot of experience doing it, or even if they've never done it before, or even if they're new to the country, or if their first thing, uh, language is in English, or whatever the case may be, um, there's there's been a real commitment that I've seen as an immigrant um, to the inclusion of different groups and to have the different voices heard. So that's um, something that is good. So if you're at home watching and you feel like this is something that you might wanna do, um, please get in touch. The uh, website is uh, unionunitedsummerville.com. Um, so visit the website, see what's going on, and remember that the meetings to learn to, to learn more about the CBA and then the ratification are on the 22nd and 23rd of September. So keep an eye on the website, and there will be more information on that too. Anything else that we want to say? I just I, I would just add that the um, initially what we found in terms of organizing was that it's it's education, it's it's. Kind of dealing with the cynicism, the the uh, skepticism, the the you know the feelings that people have that things won't change, and that's that's a, a huge problem that we had to deal with. A lot of it comes down to um, educating and and you know making sure that people understand that they have the right to do this and they have a right to be sitting at the table um, that, you know, we were told that that would never happen, uh, that the city was the only entity that could negotiate with the developer. And, you know, it was just pure persistence that got us to the table finally. Um, but the first part of it is really just learning about you know, and not being intimidated by the language, the technology, the technocratic kind of language, making people explain like what they're, you know, when they use acronyms, make them spell it out, you know, don't just sit back, ask them, you know, questions, constantly keep, you know, there's a few people that'll show up in a meeting and they want to talk over you. Don't let them. Make sure that they talk directly to you. You know, because otherwise you, that's how they, you know, that's how you get excluded. 
And so if you want to be included in, in the process, you have to be aggressive about it. All right. Mm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panel, for being here this evening and for talking about the CDA. And um, thank you to everyone who came and thank you to everyone who's watching and stay tuned for more information. And again, remember the meetings in September, please come and join us to learn more and to make your voice heard. And if you are a resident of um, Union Square or you work in the square or you volunteer consistently in the square, please vote <laughs> and vote in favor of this community effort that has taken us over five years, plus the, the early story that um, mm -hmm. Mary Jo told us about. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>